Oh, baby, a triple. Another race for the world's greatest driver, Juan Manuel Fangio. Former world champion Jim Clark leapt into the lead. That's Clark's Lotus going like a bomb. But James Hunt is the world champion by just one single point. By being a racing driver, you are under risk all the time. And if you no longer go for a gap that exists, you're no longer a racing driver. And that is Michael Schumacher ahead, the world champion. To become a four-time world champion, Sebastian Vettel, Lewis Hamilton, champion of the world. That's for all the kids out there who dream the impossible. Max Verstappen is champion of the world. Hello and welcome to episode 33 of F1 in Review. I'm Tristan Fancourt and I'm joined by Angus Gallagher. Tom still can't be with us this week, but he will return next week to discuss, well, the first race of the triple header, the final triple header of the season as we head to Austin. But before we make our predictions for the upcoming US Grand Prix, I thought it would be a good idea to go back, rewind ourselves to a certain incident that occurred during the last race weekend. And that incident was all around Lance Stroll, who I think wasn't particularly pleased with his overall overall performance. And unfortunately decided to, I would say, embarrass himself a little bit, embarrass the team a little bit, because unfortunately when, um, when he exited Q1 during qualifying, he threw his steering wheel out the car. He jumped out the car in a, in a real cloud of anger and shoved his trainer, Henry Howe, um, out the way in front of all the cameras. And after that, in front of the media, he gave what I can only describe as the shortest interview I've ever heard. I think it was something like six words in total when uh, he decided to voice well not really voice but <laughs> so, sort of voice his displeasure at what had become um of, of of him basically as he was in 17th place and that kind of got everyone thinking whether or not Lance Stroll is done is he done with the sport what what do you see his future like in Formula One I mean I think he still has a future because obviously he has favourable circumstances on the financial and paternal sides. Let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the un- the underrated factor in Formula One. Um, but yeah, I think it was shocking what we saw in Qatar in terms of him pushing his trainer. Because first of all, we thought that he was pushing a wall or punching a wall. Yeah, and it became clear it wasn't doing that. I perhaps think that I'm not saying this happens all the time, but Drivers getting frustrated in public doesn't happen as much because I think they they save it for in their private rooms when they're with their their trainers or the team principal or an engineer, and they're more honest there. You don't see that honesty either, sort of verbally or emotionally, out in the open because then immediately as soon as someone shows emotion, they'll end up getting bad press and it will be a disaster for the team. So. I think that it was shocking because of that. And obviously, I'm not condoning what he did. He pushed someone, um, possibly injured them, and that's not acceptable. But it's really interesting to s- see people's reaction to this because I think this happens more often than we we perhaps think and maybe more often since Drive to Survive came out because now you've got more behind the scenes glim- behind the scenes glimpses and you see drivers swearing more. You see them showing emotion more that we don't necessarily get to see on TV. So this was unusual. I think it was an emotion that was understandable because of the situation he's in. He's under a lot of pressure. He's got a teammate who is far exceeding him in terms of pace. Lance Stroll, a statistic that came out the other day, uh, came to light. Lance Stroll hasn't scored a point since July uh, because we've had... That was when Belgium Sucking was, and since then we've had five races and he's got zero points and he's been out in Q3, <laughs> uh, Q1, sorry, a lot recently. So he's been going through a very poor run. And that will happen sometimes, but because of the nature of him, his father's relationship and influence over the team, 
there's always going to be question marks. I thought the the po- the post qualifying interview was rather dramatic. I'd say it did. I feel like sure you're angry, but you didn't need. It's amazing how much drama you can fit into seven words. But I I kind yeah, of I, no. I kind of thought uh. that he didn't need to be that succinct, shall we say? He could have got the point well, it's across. Been sort of a bit like a, listening to a child having a um, a bit of a tantrum, right? Yeah, a little bit. Dropping in a swear word as well for for good measure. I think that, and sure, I get he's frustrated, but he could have definitely handled that better in terms of being out in the public sphere. But at the end of the day, perhaps that's just how his his emotions are feeling because at the moment he's under a lot of pressure and his seat is, I mean, I can't say that his seat's under threat from anyone because there's no outstanding candidate um, in the silly season. All the all the call is just for, right, Lance Stroll out, Lance Stroll out. And nobody is suggested as a, as a replacement. There are probably replacements out there, but yeah, it's. I just still can't see him being shifted from that team mm. because his dad's in charge. Genuinely, that's just how it is. That's just what the situation is with the Aston Martin team. They can almost afford to. They can't afford to, but if they have one driver who is struggling a lot, if you've got Fernando Alonso in the other car, it won't matter as much. Now, if it costs them fourth place in the Constructors' Championship, or even third place or second place, you could argue, in the Constructors' Championship, then you might have to re- reconsider that point of view. Well, but the rumour is, yeah. at the moment, that um, Aston Martin is, is maybe up for sale because... They're they're mm-hmm. tired of I don't know well, L- Lawrence Strolls so that's Lance Strolls' dad. Um, <laughs> they they are related if you don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that that's part. Maybe Lance Strolls' failure to extract as much as as he maybe would like out of the car and Aston Martin sort of moving backward. Um, these factors are are coming to play a little bit, and now it's rumored that. That Lawrence Stroll's putting the team up for sale for about eight hundred million dollars, which is an interesting figure, really, because if you look at what Andretti are trying to buy into the sport for, then they're looking at sort of four hundred million dollars, and teams kind of want more than that. And it was rumored sort of six hundred was like uh, the upper echelons of, of what they may be paying, but eight hundred million to be valued by a, you know for for a team isn't that outrageous therefore um and apparently that's you know the saudis are, are looking at buying the team i don't know if it's true or not but it is certainly uh, uh, you know Lawrence stroll's not a fool he's a me- very very wealthy man a, a, a billionaire let's face it he's, he is a billionaire and 800 million dollars is 800 million dollars no one's going to be thinking well pff, huh, i'm going to turn that away and so there probably is a temptation right for Lawrence stroll to think well you know my son's getting uh, on a bit and oh do i really want to keep doing this they've just spent loads of money expanding the aston martin facility they have gone through the rigmarole of building a whole new plant and it was fantastic and 2023 was brilliant until it wasn't and last was going backwards so surely temptation now is to sell get rid of the team say you know lawrence could basically um do to lance what i guess latifi's dad did to latifi when they said oh look you're going to business school now that's where Latifi is. Um, if you didn't realize, the ex-Williams driver, also kind of a, a very wealthy Canadian, uh, he's now in business school. So maybe Lance will join him, or um, or maybe not. It, these are these are just rumors. But I, Lance isn't just in a rut at the moment because a rut's not big enough for what Lance strolls in. He he's basically <laughs> just in a valley, a, just a deterioration <laughs> valley, and and he's stuck there because he he can't feel good by the fact that he's being beaten by Fernando Alonso by such an extreme margin. And to put it into perspective, Lance Stroll managed to collect 47 points when Aston Martin were really, really good. Fernando Alonso is on 183 points. It's just an absurd scale. I know that we're we're talking about how old Max Verstappen's 433 points and Sergio Perez only got 224, but at least that's only half. (laughs) I mean, this is what's ridiculous about the, the performance deficit between Lance Stroll and Fernando Alonso it's just so extreme that when you're talking about your teammate getting four times the amount of points than than you and we're not even at the end of the season yet by the way then surely 
something's got to give at some point. Because if I was an investor looking at Aston Martin, I, I would start to be putting into question the the common sense at the front of the consortium from keeping Lance Stroll there, given how much damage it's doing to the team in the long run. Yeah, it's and the talk about the long run, there could be some immediate financial damage because McLaren are now just 11 points behind Aston Martin in the Constructors' Championship. And with five races to go, my prediction that Aston Martin would not be caught is looking rather precarious. And it's looking pretty nailed on that McLaren will overtake them. Later, more about McLaren another time because they're on an absolutely incredible run of form. But Aston Martin are losing out because they have one driver who is delivering, if not exceeding, and one driver who... Is just not making a mark on the drivers' championship at all. Lance Stroll is just scraping into the top ten ahead of the two Alpines. Whilst Fernando Alonso is mixing it with Lewis Hamilton for third, and you just think, how long can a team go on with a driver who just isn't producing the amount of points that are required, for, especially if they want to get to the front of the grid? Stroll's had his moments in Formula One. He had that pretty amazing pole position in the wet conditions in Turkey a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, he's had multiple podiums. If I look up his statistics, it would tell you that he's got, well, multiple. I thought he had more than this. He's got three podiums in total. I definitely thought he had more. Um, he's shown some promising performances in certain conditions, in wet conditions, but he's just he's underwhelming overall, and it's not a driver that strikes you with fear or one that you think is going to be consistent or deliver consistently for a team that's either a top team already or that wants to get to the top. So I th I think this conversation comes becomes a lot more easy to have if Lawrence Stroll sells the team because then he, oh, does, yeah. he doesn't have to sack his own son. Someone else can do that for him. But <laughs> Imagine being sacked by your dad. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that would be the worst. The guy is supposed to have your back, you know. He's supposed to be on your side and going, yeah, don't worry, you've got this, you'll improve. But um, it could be hurtling towards that scenario soon enough because he's it, just not delivering. Well, he's believed him in for long enough, right, at, yeah. at this point. He he moved him. Was it 2018 when Force India went bust and then yep. they replaced it with Racing Point, which uh, Lawrence Stroll led the consortium to buy that. And they moved Stroll from Williams, who were last, to Racing Point, who were like mid-table, and shunted out Esteban Ocon so that Lance Stroll could get in that team. And then Ocon had a year on the sidelines. So he's already done him a massive solid by getting him this far in his career. But I just think he needs to he needs to leave the team. It, it's not This is not a reaction to the show of anger that he's had from the pit, the pit instant on mm. the last weekend, the previous race. I think it's just a general performance for general performance reasons, because he's just not been with it at all. This was just, I think what, what this weekend was, the first time I looked at Lance Stroll, I thought, that man is done. He is mm. absolutely finished. And, okay, he probably was at the time. Maybe he's not now. I mean, looking at what he's been saying in response to these questions, he's been saying, oh, well, I'm just, you know, in a rut, I was frustrated, and no, no, I'm really keen to continue. But I have to wonder... Is this just going to get worse? I think it's going to get worse personally because I don't I don't see Lance being able to compete. He's not beaten any of his teammates at all. And no. I think I just think it's a bit of a weird thing now, Lance Stroll. Like I, he is a I'm sure he's a nice bloke. Everyone in the paddock says that he's really nice. And yeah, okay, fine. He has these moments or whatever, and, and everyone's going to get frustrated, especially when you're at the top of your, your game. You know, the bigger you are, the the harder you fall. And I'm sure Lance. Was you know he he is a great driver. It's, it's no you know it's worth saying that he's one of twenty Formula One drivers. He is a brilliant driver, but he's not a brilliant Formula One driver, and that's the nuance there. But I have to wonder: is this the end for him? And if it's if it's not because he doesn't want to leave, it should be because every he needs to go. He just needs to go at some point. And and I wonder whether or not. The Lawrence Stroll is starting to think the same thing because it just can't continue with Aston Martin failing to be where they should be because they refuse to get rid of a driver that, let's face it, isn't scoring the points that they necessarily need. You just wonder what it would have been like if they had managed to grasp some alternative talent in there. I mean, 
like they've got Dramovich waiting in the wings in in their driver program. Give him a shot. See what happens. I mean, if there's anything we've learned from Ricardo's outing and his broken wrist, it's that it turns out you see just shove someone in a car for a bit, and then then that's the best way to see if they're good or not. None of this. Oh, let's see how well they've risen through the ranks of Formula Three and and Formula Two. I think I'm putting a vote that we should have a wild card race at some point where every team just has to chuck in a driver and see what happens because we could have some really interesting things, especially as there's a big promotion of the F1 Academy and, and pushing them into the sport as well. Let's just see what happens when we can put people in, in cars and then find out who's the best and then everyone would fight over them. It'd be brilliant. But at the moment, we'd have none of that. We're just sticking around with the same old drivers. People that should be getting into the sport aren't getting into the sport because... We've got a roadblock in the form of Lance Stroll. So the, the final question, Angus, for you about this is, is this, do you think it's ever going to happen again? And if it is, should it? Maybe one day. To be honest, you say that. Look who's applying to come into the sport. The Andrettis. They have a history of, on merit, admittedly, they have a history of promoting their children into racing teams. Mario, double Formula One world champion. Michael, roast in Formula One, and he's multi- IndyCar champion and then they had a son called Marco he won races in IndyCar so if Marco has a son that'd be Mario's great grandson then you know there could be another little Andretti in there another M yeah yeah it has to be surely you've got to keep it up for the rest of time now yeah. but yeah I possibly but it's, it's very unique isn't it it's very very unique that you have a businessman who's wealthy enough to invest in Formula One and who's child is quick enough to be in formula one at least quick enough for a bit it's um it's interesting that that has happened and will it happen again <sighs> not entirely sure i was going to ask you a, a question actually just if we were to play a little game if we had to predict who would replace lance stroll aston martin who would we say? Because I read an article earlier this week saying Yuki Tsunoda has been linked. <laughs> I still think what Alex. An I think. Question. I think Alex Albon personally. I think I said that for a bit. Um, I think that would be a good route to go down. But what do you reckon? I, that's what that would be my suggestion. Well, I mean, I, I would still be looking at some someone like Ted Pacheco or, or someone like that, and 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 be looking through the Formula Two. Um, sort of top upcoming um drivers and i think that that line of thought has i have been emphasized by the success that we've seen in piastri and liam lawson so far and i think there is some good talent coming up and through the ranks and you know it's worked very well for mclaren for example and i hope it works out really well for alvatari so the yuki snowda ones are, are quite an interesting point because Yuki Tsunoda is now being passed up, isn't he, by uh, Red Bull? Yes. They don't. They don't want him to. Um, well, they don't really want him in Red Bull because they would have promoted him by now. They would have chucked out Perez and put in Tsunoda. I think that's what they would have done if they wanted him. Ricardo's back, and so there's the new favorite. You know, it's your your favorite son's returned. You know, <laughs> you've got that favorite sibling, and they move off to university, and then you can be number one for a bit, and they come back, and you're like, oh, oh, it's really great to see you <laughs> back here stealing my limelight. That's what Ricardo is. Ricardo is the favorite child. Um, <laughs> well, no, really, Max is, isn't he? But you know, Ricardo is special in that in that sense. And then you've got this up and coming Liam Lawson character who who is kind of outshone you during a period where you should be you know easily being the the top up-and-coming driver in the red bull group because yuki sonoda did um defeat quite ruthlessly nick devries i think and, and hold on to his own but of course now 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 where's yuki sonoda he's in limbo land he's got nothing going for him now and so i i think it's a possibility that they'd be looking at him i don't I don't think it's going to happen because in order for that to happen, Alonso's got to go or Stroll's got to go. Um, but it's safe to say that Sonoda has really come into his own in the last sort of two years. When when I think it's he has definitely moved on from the super angry, shouty, crashy man that he was just a couple of years ago. And I, I you know 
there were some really funny moments. Um, for example, during the, the um, Canadian Grand Prix um, two years ago, when he came with pit lane straight into the the gravel and just started swearing down the mic, and you're thinking, oh, yeah. right, well, you know, that was you, wasn't it? But it's mm-hmm. no one else's fault. But he he has to you can say his credit been doing quite well this year, and he. He is in 17th place in, in an AlphaTauri that basically was was awful at the beginning. Um, and he's collected a few points. But importantly, you know, he has been showing that he can get that car up into the points. Yeah. But I just don't think that Aston Martin would want him either because he's in another group. He is definitely gunning for that Red Bull. And there is enough talent elsewhere that you said sort of in that grey area of F1 talent where... You're in the sport, but you're not going up. You're not going into the teams that are potentially challenging for the the championships. And I do wonder whether or not Yuki Tsunoda is consistent enough as well. I reckon Aston Martin low-key as well are thinking for them to be taken seriously if they have to depart with Lance Stroll and send him on his merry way. I think they have to have someone who is de- a definite upgrade. Yuki Tsunoda would be an upgrade, but would he be that much of an upgrade? I'm not entirely sure. That's why I think that Albon appears the more lucrative option. A bit like how I was thinking about other possible options. Guan Yu Zhou, young, hungry, but is he quick enough compared to the others? I don't think he'd be. He'd fit the bill. Ocon and Gasly, I think they'd stick with Alpine. Anyone else would see it as a downgrade, realistically. I wouldn't see Norris or Piastri going there. Maybe once Alonso retires, you might get maybe, I don't know, Sainz or Leclerc possibly moving there to sort of be the the pioneer for the next few years that teams take them forward. So I think that that leaves Albon as the best option. Snow is a fair shout, but I think that they will want to have themselves taken more seriously. If they If they employed Stroll, and then replaced him with Logan Sargent. You'd be like, oh, seriously? You're taking the mick here. Like, you replaced one average driver with another. Like, what are you doing? I thought you were wanting to progress. So it has to be someone I think they understand who would be an, a definite upgrade. I I do wonder, though, whether or not it is, for someone like Alex Albon, is it such an upgrade going from Williams to Aston Martin in the long term? Because Williams Maybe. is on an upward trajectory and has support behind it of Mercedes. They've got the, well, I think a really good team principal in James Vowles now, who was um, chief strategist at Mercedes. And the team itself has got a, you know a good amount of money behind it and doesn't have this weird interpolitics thing going on at the moment that, that Aston Martin certainly has. So if you're Alex Albon, would you perhaps stay at Williams instead of moving over? Because you've got that long-term prosperity that, that I think Williams is showing for the first time in a long time. And just, I guess, to add to that slightly, don't forget that way back when Lewis Hamilton made that decision to leave McLaren and move over the, for the first time to Mercedes, Mercedes wasn't a front runner. It was developing itself slowly. It hadn't. It was doing okay. You getting you know, podiums here, here, and there, and everyone said, "What were you doing?" And and as it turns out, what he was doing was he was buying into a team that had a long term, sort of you know, strategy, a really good one. So is is Williams like that? You know, not necessarily doing great now really good in the future and therefore is Alex Alvin actually best served is it a more tempting pros- you know, prospect to stay in Williams as opposed to moving Aston Martin given that Aston Martin's going backwards I would say that it would be an upgrade just because I don't think Williams is suddenly going to fly their way up the grid feel free to replay this next year when I'm proven wrong yeah. but <laughs> I think your that, predictions haven't been great <laughs> yeah I mean I don't know I think that I think that it would still be an upgrade at this stage because I think that if you take Albon out of Williams, they are in a lot worse of a position. I think he is exceeding what that car can do at the moment. So for me, 
it would still be an upgrade. And you got to remember, Aston Martin have got multiple podiums this year. Short in the hands of a, in the hands of a very good driver, aka Alonso. But I still think it'd be an upgrade, just because. Also, it would be an upgrade because then if you had two drivers who are exceeding expectations in their respective teams, that's an even more potent mix or a potent combination for Aston Martin to have. So I would see it as an upgrade personally if I was Albon. I don't know. I'd, I'm not so convinced. I I think that Williams is going up and in seventh place at the moment is, is jolly good, to be honest. Um as I say, but I've got a soft spot. I have a soft spot for Williams. I always want them to do very well. And I don't feel like Aston Martin at the moment are necessarily as good as a good a prospect, but that's only because I'm just looking at that, that the current direction of travel and Williams has had such an advancement in terms of the last year, just where they have started and where they're going. And I think if they can continue that, I mean, well, look, if they, they continue that going from 10th to 7th, they expect them to be fourth next year. And I'll be laughing. Ha, uh, fourth place, Williams. That'd be wonderful, huh. wouldn't it? It'd be, it'd be, you know, that, but that, that's, it's not out of the realm of possibility, I guess. Um, <laughs> but they've really got to get themselves um, in gear. But uh, Aston Martin, there's no getting away from the fact that Aston Martin has a huge amount of money behind it. But, you know, that's, that's what comes from, I guess the starting position and, and what Williams has had to do is get itself out of the, the death spiral. That was the fact that their, their performance was going down. And as a result, the places, the points they were getting was going down. So sponsors were pulling out. So money goes down again, facilities start reducing in quality parts get worse. So the performance goes down and down and down and down and down to eventually you, well, you, you fall out of the sport, you become, Caterham or, or Lotus. Lotus is the, the, the great example, really, and their death spiral that led to their total economic collapse until, well, it's got recently you know, taken over by um Chinese brand. And, well, maybe one day it will come back. Who knows? But I, I doubt hmm. it at the moment. But, yeah, it is, it is odd now how, looking back, someone like Lotus, who was a massive, massive part of Formula One. But Williams, I think is going forward and I would like Albon to stay there because I don't want to risk Albon losing his mojo again because I'm not sure we can take that <laughs> it's just not he just needs to stay where he's good and hopefully then he'll perform well with the team as they go on forward but it's time to move on really to another team that I think is has got themselves out of a bit of a, a downward spiral and that's my favorite team the one I've, I've supported since I was very small um, I well, I can't remember ever supporting another team actually, uh, and that's uh, McLaren. It's time to talk about McLaren, my favourite topic, and McLaren's <laughs> excellent trajectory back up the standings, which also is great because I've been I've been watching McLaren for far too long, and and they've decided not to be good for a long time, and that makes me very sad. And um, I bought a, my first piece of merch since I was. Uh, big. <laughs> now I'm an earning human. I realised that I could actually buy merchandise, and uh, I bought a hoodie um, from uh, McLaren because it was in the sale, and it's very snuggly. And I was going to wear it this weekend at the race weekend because it's cold here in the UK now, and that would be excellent because I feel like I can support a team in public that isn't at the back, which is brilliant. Because Aston, Aston Martin, and McLaren are now locked into a fight for who is going to get fourth place. And heads up. I think it's going to be McLaren because they are on 219 points versus Aston Martin's 230 points. But unlike Aston Martin, they have two drivers that can get on the podium and win some sort of race. Yay, Piastri! Um, hmm. So uh, McLaren has just absolutely skyrocketed its points in the last um, few races. And with five races left and you know a couple of sprints in there too, an 11-point deficit between McLaren and Aston Martin, given that Lance Stroll and Fernando Alonso are finding it harder and harder to score points, and McLaren are getting on the podium, uh, both drivers on the podium, and winning a sprint race. Angus, is McLaren going to get fourth place? And with um, Ferrari on, at the moment, 298 points, is it going to be possible by the end of the season for McLaren to catch up with Ferrari? So let's start with that first question. Is Aston Martin going to slip back to fifth place and McLaren going to take their glorious victory in fourth place? 
Oh, do I stick with my original prediction just to save face, or do I? Well, what was your original prediction? Well, when it was first mooted to us, I said that Aston Martin would stay ahead of McLaren, and that McLaren wouldn't catch them, which was feels a long time ago now that I made that prediction. I think it was maybe after Hungary or Belgium, when, in my defence, at the time, if I go back to the results of the Belgian Grand Prix, I want to say that Aston Martin was so far ahead because they were still producing good pace. McLaren was starting to... That was the race where Piastri got second in the sprint, so he was tracking upwards, and he was. it was kind of the weekend where he first... Not broke through, but you thought, OK, he's finally doing some real good progress. And then he got bunted out the first corner with science, so it didn't work out so well. But after that race, McLaren were 93 points behind... Aston Martin so they were st- at that point Ferrari were behind Aston Martin so I thought to myself well unlikely that McLaren will catch them I don't think it'll happen they won't track positively that much that they'll manage to make up the amount of points but I've been wrong they are right on their tails and now it looks a lot more precarious for Aston Martin will they be caught you know what <sighs> I have to say yes because they're so close that they almost they can't not be caught. You look at common sense right now and you look at the <laughs> yep. amount of pace that McLaren have compared to Aston Martin. I mean, if you forget Lance Stroll for one minute and how he turned out last weekend having a stinker. Fernando Alonso was fighting for fifth and sixth, but that was in a race where one Red Bull's out of position, one Mercedes was out of the race, one Ferrari didn't start the race. So, realistically... Aston Martin are the fifth fastest team right now. But the problem for them is McLaren are the second fastest team. And they gained a healthy, healthy amount of points in both the sprint race and also the main race. The problem for Aston Martin being as well that previously you'd have said, right, five races to go, that's the opportunities for points that McLaren will have. But the problem is there's two sprint races to come as well. So that is just an extra 15 points per race that McLaren would be able to gain from that. And in the last race, McLaren almost got that full quota of maximum points. They got 14 points in the sprint because Piastri won. And so, and then Norris came in third. So, like, it's looking more and more like, well, McLaren are just going to race past them. My, my thing that I'm thinking is McLaren... We should have a new prediction if we were to have a bit of jeopardy. Mm-hmm. McLaren is 79 points behind Ferrari. Is that catchable? I don't think so, but... Well, that was my second question. So you don't you don't think they're going to be able to catch them? Well, 79 points in five races and two sprints is a lot, and I think it's probably not... It's not, it's not catchable, but I said that before. So, yeah, I'm going to keep my mouth shut, I think, just to <laughs> save face. <laughs> it, it is hard, and... To, to be fair, I I also agree that I don't think they'd be able to catch a Ferrari because even if you're going to be very generous and I, I'm ignoring sprints here because, uh, you know, it's just more complicated than it needs to be. But in, in a traditional race, right, so if you I'm, I'm going to assume Max Verstappen's going to win everything uh, for this next little bit. But um, right, it's 18 points for second and 15 points for third. So even if, if McLaren... Basically, for the next five races, they've got second and third for every single one. That would give them 165 points. And then you're plusing so seven points and six points um, on top of that for the last couple of sprint races as well. So, you know, we could be generous and say there's about 180 odd points left. And unfortunately for Ferrari, I mean, Ferrari probably can get sort of fourth, fifth, um, and that would give them 110 points. And so uh, that means that there is only sort of 50 points they're going to make up in that in that time so i i think that's what my prediction is i think that mclaren is going to get past aston martin but it's basically going to end the season about 50 points behind ferrari and that's because ferrari have had such such a good start to the the, the season as well and I, I well not a good start in terms of what they did last time where they actually managed to get into first place in the constructors championship and let's not forget um that for a, for a while in 2022 we thought Ferrari were going to win the constructors championship but they've had a good start compared to McLaren in the beginning of this season McLaren were way back way back in performance i was expecting them to be in 
10th place by the end. Um, because as a McLaren fan, it's just we just become pessimistic as soon as they get near the back. You think, well, that's it then. Another five years in the doldrums. Um, but ever since Austria and that they've turned, they really turned it around. But I don't think they're going to be able to do enough. I think it's going to be incredibly difficult. Basically, for Ferrari to lose third place at the moment, I think they're just going to have to set, you know, basically pull a full Ferrari, full season Ferrari. We're we're talking pit stops that never end. We're thinking Charles Leclerc planting it into every wall that is is there. Um, Carlos Sainz getting all the bad luck and being taken out by everyone else. You know they're gonna have to balls the strategy up to an extent that we haven't seen for for a good long time. Especially you know not since the peak of of um, last year when. Ferrari were running some interesting strategies. Like, uh, never forget the infamous uh, medium soft, medium medium strategy, which I think they pulled in one race just to see what happened. And uh, turns out they you were last if you pit that many times in a race. You know, we, we hmm. I think Ferrari, even Ferrari, can't lose third place. That's what we're saying at the moment. And um, Ferrari fans, I really feel for you. I understand the pain. But I think third place is really locked into there. So I think when we get to the end of the season, McLaren is going to overtake Aston Martin. And I, I think Aston Martin will be lucky that they, they finish in fifth place. If Alpine had been more competitive, then I think perhaps they could have slipped even further down because they're just not collecting points. So I, I, I'm i concerned for Aston Martin. But for, for McLaren, I think this is only going to go up. And it, I, I'm so excited for 2024 because... I genuinely think right here, right now, knowing everything that we have in front of us, I think maybe constructors contenders for the first time in what decade for for McLaren. All they need to do is bring back that silver and red Vodafone livery, and for, I'll buy all the merch. There you go, Zach. Hmm. I will buy it all. I'll buy all your merch. I'll, buy, I'll even buy a bucket hat. I've not ever worn a bucket hat. And I don't, I don't know what way around a bucket hat goes. But I'll, I'll buy two. But yes, I'll buy all the merch if you bring back that that great livery. Because I miss it um, a lot. And uh, the orange just doesn't do it for me as much as then. But I <laughs> sorry, I really do think that, that, that this time next year, we will be talking about the, the Constructors' Championship between... Um, well, I hope McLaren and Red Bull. Do you reckon that the silver chrome livery gives them special powers? And that as soon as they put that on, it just like re-spawns back to the days when they were championship contenders and it gives makes the car quick enough. It blinds the other the other people. I think that's what it is. Whenever they put on the silver, yeah. the, the beating sun blinds the competitors. You know, everyone wincing away. Yeah. Oh, what is that <laughs> streaking past? It's uh, it's the bright silver. Uh, McLaren, I love it. It's the best livery. I well, it's up there with the Lotus um, black and gold livery and um, the John Player special livery. And also now, now I'm sort of yeah. talking about it. Also the golf livery, the blue and, and orange one. I have a soft spot for that. But that that silver one is the the livery of my childhood. That's that was so cool. And I remember it's iconic. It is iconic. It is the iconic livery of our time, or, or well, of my time. I remember distinctly watching Lewis Hamilton getting his, his world championship in that silver car and then getting a gold Blue Peter badge. And I thought it was the best thing ever because it was the first time I ever saw the McLaren Technology Center. And I just thought it looked like a spaceship and McLaren were the best thing ever. And those are the moments in Formula One that, that hook you into the sport, I think. So, um, if if there is a chance to go to that, if Zach, if you're listening, invite me down. I will cry, and it will make a great YouTube video. I reckon he is listening. You know. Oh yeah. I reckon they're Absolutely. putting putting it on the list right now. He's a, he's a big he's a big fan. Um, do you think McLaren then can sustain a championship challenge next season? Because it's something which I I read about and I thought I had to think about it myself, and I thought to myself, hmm, too soon. Perhaps, but it's a nice, it's a nice, it's a tantalizing thought, isn't it? Well, what, if I ask you, who, what's the best driver lineup on the grid? Who, who, what is it? What's the best driver lineup at the moment? You, you can't chop and change between teams. 
But if, you, if I said, right, okay, you know, pick pick the best two on there who, you know, they complement each other, what, what would you go for? Probably Hamilton and Russell, honestly. Interesting. I know Russell's having a bit of an off year, but mm. you wanted me to say Norris and Piastri, didn't uh, you? No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'd say that I'd say Hamilton and Russell, yeah. Just because it's between them and obviously, I mean, Verstappen and Perez is is up there simply because of Verstappen himself, honestly. Just just him just, on his own makes those two the with. best two drivers. <laughs> so Huge, yeah, that's that's my answer. Verstappen is the best pairing on the grid. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I I do accept that Hamilton and Russell are good. I I do. It, well, I mean, well, this weekend. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> there was more success in the in McLaren. No, I, I I agree. They are a great pairing, and actually, if there was someone gonna be fighting, um, that m- my position, which is it's it's Piastri and Norris, then that that would be what I go for as well. You are absolutely right. Max Verstappen, it's just phenomenal at the moment, and if if they put in Piastri or Lando Norris into that Red Bull with Max, I I I dread. To, to think what would happen it would it would be on another level i think and if you can imagine Scary. another level i know exactly for, for red bull but i think at the moment as it stands piastri and norris are the best i don't necessarily know who's number one i i think at the moment lando is probably the number one driver at the moment given lando's got more experience within mclaren but there's no getting away from the fact that this is twice now. Lando Norris has been beaten to a race win by a team teammate. Uh, Ricardo took the the win um, in Monza away from Norris, and then in the sprint race in the last in the last weekend, it was Piastri who managed to take the win there. And I, I think Norris was very tempted to get past. Um, Piastri during the Grand Prix, but stuck to orders, and I think that's the quality of McLaren at the moment. They got two drivers that could both be in P two, and they're both listening to the team. And I know that Hamilton and George Russell are, are immensely talented in the Mercedes at the moment, and Hamilton, I, in my opinion, is is the best driver on the grid, uh, and well, best driver in, in ever, I think. Um, but there's no getting away from the fact he's getting older, and George Russell at the moment is not doing as well as he could. So I don't, I just don't see it. I don't rate it quite as highly. It's like nine point oh for McLaren and eight point eight for uh, for Mercedes. So it's it's pretty close. But that's why I think we'll retain the championship. I think that's that level of consistency where both could be in P two or both could be in you know and, and P three then I think that's what will make McLaren uh, succeed in, in holding on to the constructors. Interesting. I were, I'd want to see if Piastri would keep up his strong momentum, which, sure, I reckon, realistically, he will. But, yeah, I still think Hamilton and Russell, just because of their pedigree, Hamilton's pedigree especially, and then what Russell, what we've seen that he can do, most of the time in terms of in that Mercedes car. Lest you forget, he's had a bit of a poor year, but he has won a race in that car. So we shouldn't, uh, shouldn't, uh, yeah, shouldn't put him down too much, I'd say. But no, it's an interesting debate, to be fair, when you do have a clear best driver on the grid at the best team, but then you also have a teammate of his who is, at the moment, I think the word that comes to mind is subpar. And... Whilst this year it's worked out very well for them because they have a very fast car, there might be scenarios further down the line where, yeah, it bites them in the backside. But I reckon they've got it under control, realistically. They will, uh, they know what they're doing, Red Bull, generally. But we'll see. Interesting times. As the year draws to a close, we're going to be finding ourselves wanting to talk about the future a lot more, I reckon, because of the fact that both championships have been sewn up so we'll see see where that comes to and we'll uh, we'll be doing what I'm sure we're doing all sorts of possible scenarios in our head and both out loud as well 
And that's all we got time for in this episode of F1 in Review. Thank you very much for listening to us cover, well, two topics, I think. But it was sort of a, a ramble through um, uh, the past, present and future of, of Formula One. As we head towards, as I said, a, a triple header. My goodness, what an complicated weekend we've got coming up for you because not only is it a, a sprint weekend but it's also some of the different timings and perhaps we'd expect from formula one so I'll, I'll crack on with friday if you fancy watching the qualifying you can tune in in the uk at 10 p.m and then on saturday there's there are two events for you to enjoy so it's 6 30 we've got the um, Grand Prix sprint shootout so that's the qualifying but we're not allowed to call it qualifying for the um the sprint race so join in tune in for the the sprint shootout qualifying at 6 30 and then we have the sprint race itself at 11 o'clock at night on saturday so that will drift into sunday really um so another one get your coffee at the ready if you're in the uk because you'll be staying up late if you want to catch the sprint race and then finally on sunday if, just in case you hadn't watched enough formula one by that point we have the actual US Grand Prix in Austin where temperatures are supposed to be absolutely roasting and it's going to be at 8 o'clock uh, at night if you are in the UK. You can adjust that for your relevant time zone. So plenty to get your teeth into this weekend. We will of course be back uh, next week to digest what happened you can of course follow us on our social media sites so that's x for formerly twitter as well as tiktok where we post short snippets of these episodes if you fancy listening to the key topics on one to two minute sound bites and you can also follow us on youtube as well where you get full versions of these episodes and you can catch the full podcast as well if you fancy listening on that platform of course we are on every other <laughs> podcasting platform as well be it spotify apple podcasts as well if you fancy listening to us on any of those so if you got to this point thank you very much and tune in next week <laughs>